Yeah, 52 reasons to be excited as we come to you this Wednesday on the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University, Wilm U Works, Danny Pommels, Noah Levick, Ben Berry in the cut, and Joel Embiid scores 52. But what does it really amount to as uh, the Sixers make a push for the postseason, taking on a Celtics team that probably wasn't showing you all of their wrinkles, but maybe there was a bit of a playoff preview in the game after all. We'll get to that in a little bit, but... No, it was one of those games where <laughs> they tried to go small on Joel Embiid and they paid for it. Uh, Grant Williams, not the same size as Joel Embiid, although that was the guy with Robert Williams out that they gave the task of trying to slow down the MVP favorite, particularly if you listen to Doc Rivers. Um, but in the end, you're beating a Celtics team that, like I said, isn't quite giving you everything that they might have because of the potential playoff matchup that could come between these two teams so as a Sixers fan what do you make of that game how do you are, are you overjoyed are you taking it with a grain of salt what, what's what's the perspective there I think we've always here been big on appreciate Joel Embiid's greatness and, and to me this was one of those nights where that's the bottom line and a lot of the other stuff is is borderline irrelevant I and mean, this guy scored 52 points on 22, 25 field goal attempts, only missed five uh, from the floor. And, you know, on one hand, it is exceptional for him. It is an especially great game. But you look this year, 44 of the 65 appearances, he's at 30 or more points. And oftentimes it is indeed incredibly efficient and it's built upon just ridiculous skill and finesse and body control and power from the nail. And, to see him display it all the way he did last night, I think is special and just worthy of appreciation in isolation and all honesty. Uh, and sure, if you are rooting for Joel Embiid to win the MVP award, I think there's zero question. This uh, substantially increased his odds to do so. I think folks on the fence and looking for a reason to go one way or the other, uh, this sure gave them a, a pretty compelling reason to uh, go with Mr. Embiid. As we've said this year, he's been really insistent on just making the right play over and over again, whether that's the shot or the pass. And I thought that was an encouraging big picture aspect of this game. Uh, down the stretch, he goes to an unlikely hero in P.J. Tucker, who's obviously not known for the scoring, but uh, knocks down three clutch threes. And um, if you're looking for you know, sources of optimism, I think that would be high on my list, just Embiid. Uh, being unselfish in that way and having awareness of who's open and then also trusting uh, that the guy will get the job done as PJ Tucker did indeed. But this was to me very similar to the Utah game where Embiid at 59 in that pretty much everything besides him uh, was not, not very positive, right? I mean, Tyrese Maxey two for eight, Tobias Harris two for eight, uh, Sixers bench heavy lineups, not successful, uh, so th that's just the reason they won the game is Joel Embiid. Uh, they absolutely would have been crushed here uh, if he was not a Sixer. But look, he is a Sixer, and uh, that's reason to, I think, feel that the team always has a shot to pull off something special and to beat the elite teams in the NBA. So uh, I think definitely there are, there are some interesting playoff preview aspects here, but – Look, and th this is a, a night about just Joel Embiid is unbelievably great. He, he's already like a franchise legend. He's already one of the best big men in NBA history. Uh, and nights like this, I think, hammer it home and also make you aware that like, anything is possible uh, as long as he's on your team, even if that is a flawed team and, and a team that has you know legit concerns heading into the postseason. His third 50 point game of his career, and he was asked afterward about or fifth, fifth. Of the career, third of the third of the season, third so, of the season, fifth, thought, fifth of his career, third of the season. Yeah. And he was asked, you know, which one was the most special, and it was the Utah game that he directly went to and said that that was the one that felt the most special. And you know, getting back to the passes that he made to PJ Tucker down the stretch that kind of sealed the win. It was uh, a lot of nuance that went into that. Doc Rivers saying that it was James Harden's idea to move Tobias Harris to the dunker spot and push P.J. out to the corner. Harden saying that 
PJ is a good corner three point shooter. So I thought that he could, you know, help us out there. And with Joel's vision, it was a great compliment. Joel also saying how working from the nail gives the opposing team a harder, uh, it's harder for them to double team him successfully because he has so many If people are in the right places. It gives him so much vision of the court and outlet opportunities and chances to find shooters. And that would be the playoff preview part I teased about because that three point shooting in the corner in the clutch is what you brought PJ Tucker here for. Those are the things that you hope to see pay dividends in the postseason. And here it was, against a quality opponent, albeit without Robert Williams, albeit without Jalen Brown, you didn't quite get the Celtics at full force, which also makes you take the win with a grain of salt. But nothing like seeing the guy Joel Embiid mentioned by name after losing in the postseason last year come through here in a game where, particularly coming off the way the Bucks handled you, even though it's not a full, uh, you know, intense playoff type of game you still want to get a win here on your home floor in the uh penultimate home game of the season yeah and this and this is one of those similar to the the lakers game a while back where a loss would have felt catastrophic because of how horrifically the sixers right, like, like the loss would have meant so much more than the actual win does <laughs> it's like it did feel that way at a certain point yeah they were they were up seven points with 9.8 seconds left and oh we didn't even get into that please right and yeah and, yeah and then jason tatum again has a you know clutch opportunity as he did last time when he, he get the game winner over the sixers uh this time misses a game tying attempt but the Sixers, as Doc Rivers uh, acknowledged and ran through, did a million things wrong. It's just failure to like, inbound the ball, committing fouls to stop the clock, uh, and just being really disorganized and chaotic in a bad way uh, as they were looking to stamp the victory. So definitely a sigh of relief for them <laughs> that uh, it was not a loss. And as Rivers said, you know, there's a lot of film that they will have to highlight what not to do late in games. Uh, and this is, is certainly a example of that, that, uh, that they will point to. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a still, nevertheless, a, a feel good win, just not getting swept by Boston and having an even greater level of confidence that like we got the best player in the world on our team and we have role players that, will step up around him to do whatever is necessary, even if it doesn't look exactly the same every night. I think there are still fascinating questions as far as like how those role players are employed, what the rotation is looks like, who closes games. But yeah, PJ Tucker sure seems like he's going to be a, a central part of this. And a lot of that's going to be defense, but corner threes is, is what he is known for. And, he delivered. I also thought it was kind of a wild stat that he's played 74 games and until the, the game against the Raptors, the home game prior to this, had not made more than three uh, three pointers in a game this season. And now he's done it in the last two home games. So I, po- I suppose if you're the optimistic type, that is an indication that he is uh, trending up and his jumper is uh, feeling good heading into the postseason. He is he is around 40%, and he's been, he's been pretty reliable for that. And the vast majority of the shots are from the corners. And, yes, I, I think I've noticed, you know, fans are not always thrilled at the volume from him. I think they want, <laughs> they want more of the open shots to go up. They don't want him to only be shooting, you know, when he's wide open. But, uh, hey, he knows himself. He knows his teammates. He knows his role. And he – like late in games does trust himself to uh, shoot the ball when that's best for the team. And he, uh, he made some huge ones there. Yes, he did. And you're taking in the totality of these last two games, particularly if you're a Sixers fan, you play the bucks, they come out and shoot terrifically in the first quarter and go wire to wire on you. You play the Celtics, they're down two starters yet. You squeak it out uh, in the end and survive some mistakes and Tyrese Maxey falling out of bounds and 
and one fouls by oh, also Tyrese Maxey. But all that being said, it's just um, difficult to look at these last two games and feel super optimistic for me that the Sixers at their best are better in a seven game series than the Bucks or Celtics at their very best. So I'm just going to say that and be frank with everybody out there because it, it's so much is made of the postseason and how significant it is. And I've talked a lot about the journey being important as well, because that's where you form what you're going to war with in that second season, um, for lack of a better term. But um, I, I don't know, man. I don't feel um, <laughs> so jovial and encouraged that they're a team that has a – Four wins in a seven-game series against the Bucks or Celtics. I, I just that, that's just what the eye test and what the season has told me. Um, yes, Joel Embiid is the best player on the floor, oftentimes, and James Harden can be the second best player on the floor. But do they have enough? Are they deep enough? Um, I, I almost think that there's some type of wrinkle that they need to try to implement with the starting lineup that I know won't happen, but I, I'm just talking from what the eye test is telling me. Um, is the eye test telling you something, Noah? Yeah, I think I'm on the same page, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we've been pretty consistent and yeah. they don't look quite as good. As I mean, we, we're doing this podcast. We're trying to keep the, you know, optimism on everybody, but. And, I, and there's, there's tons of reasons to be optimistic. They're better. Than last year, heading into the playoffs, they have a. They better are. Chance. They are better than last year. Yeah, better better vengeances, as you've mentioned on the website and a couple of your pieces. Yeah, but. just just a more well-rounded team, a little more depth, a little more versatility. Joel Embiid's a little better. James Harden's having a better season. Tyrese Maxey has improved. So and I do know that it's a huge gap between the Sixers and the Celtics and Bucks. Like you know, last year when it got down to the final four teams in the conference finals on both sides, there was a level of basketball. I knew the Sixers weren't quite at, and I do kind of get that feeling now, but I don't think it's a huge gap. Agreed. Yeah. And I, I think it feels likely that should they match up, it'll be a six or seven game series and there will be fine margins and some random little thing will end up mattering a lot. You know, whether that's PJ Tucker you know, grabbing a clutch offensive rebound or you know, Derek White has a, a huge game or, or Brogdon or what have you. Uh, certainly the depth depth questions remain, uh, despite, I think, the improvement there from last year. I think just how much is George Niang going to play if he's not making shots? They depend a lot on him, man. They depend a lot on him. Would, would, would you, for the sake of versatility, athleticism, is there a way that they can I, – I know it's just spitballing, but I feel like Jalen McDaniels could bring some of that interchangeability into the starting lineup. It's so late in the season. I know they're not going to do something like that, but um, it's like maybe Tobias Harris on the bench might be something that could bring some of that oomph. But um, And not that it's Tobias Harris's fault, but I just look at – you know, once again, Smart, Brown, and uh, Tatum, their interchangeability, their experience. And Jalen McDaniels doesn't necessarily bring that, but he does bring some of that athleticism, maybe a little bit better rebounding. Um, I don't know. But uh, these last two games have shown me that I think that it's going to take some, you know, really close to excellent basketball for – at, you know, four games to get a win for the Sixers to beat these these Sixers and Bucks. I mean, the Celtics and Bucks, I should say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Harris, we all know he, he tends to get a little more scrutiny than the average player when he has a, a rough game. And last night was a rough game. And he hasn't been great, you know, overall against Boston. I do think his defense down the stretch outside of one unnecessary region was very good on Tatum, and that is a plus. Um, I think he's a physical, sturdy defender and has legitimately improved there a lot to the point that you trust him on some stars in certain situations. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I would think that would be a bit 
you know, too extreme of a move to, to throw McDaniels into a starting role, but I totally understand in certain situations he's a guy uh, where increasing his minutes you know, might be super sensible. I mean, the Sixers were quite clearly the less threatening transition team last night. I think the game ended with a fast break point. That's 15-0 to zero for the Celtics, and some of that's just transition defense breakdowns by the Sixers, but a lot of it's them not playing especially fast and lacking athleticism. So absolutely think... Uh, There are spots where more McDaniels minutes uh, might be a good move, especially if he's making threes, made a couple uh, nice ones last night. And I think just house over uh, Niang like would have been a pretty common sense decision last night at a certain point. I was surprised Uh, Niang was still, you know, in the mix for the second half. And I think Daniel house, uh, as we've noted, has given the Sixers, high quality minutes since uh, returning to the rotation picture. And yes, the style is unorthodox and and a little wild seeming at times, but oftentimes he's going to be a helpful guy for you on both ends of the floor. Yeah. And he's not going to be in my mind, at least a harmful player. Uh, There's obviously the upside with Niang of you love spacing around James Harden and those lineups tend to be great. Harden and Niang and, uh, a guy knocks down a couple threes, you know, that swings a game. But I think uh, that will be fascinating to see whether Doc Rivers indeed is willing to turn away from George Yang and go with a more athletic, well-rounded option if George Yang is just not making shots. You know, the ideal world is uh, he's you know, making 40-plus percent of his threes and you can live with defense occasionally being problematic. But – we all know the playoffs uh, don't always play out the way you would, you know, perfectly envision in your head. So uh, some of those alternatives I think will need to be on the table, just flexibility overall. And, and that to me is at the top of my mind, uh, just Daniel house quite possibly being a player uh, who the Sixers should prefer over Niang and in some situations and look, just the closing lineups. I think that that's going to be a lot of scrutiny on that too. Um, To Doc Rivers' credit, the uh, game the Sixers last played in Boston, you know, he didn't close with Tobias Harris. So I think Tobias Harris is is in all likelihood going to keep starting games, but Doc Rivers at times has not included Harris and or Tucker in his closing lineups when it's clear, you know, Melton or uh, McDaniels or someone else is a better option. Um, So I think ideally for the Sixers, that continues and there's, good adaptability on uh, the part of their coach with using, you know, this pieces uh, at his disposal. Let's pay some bills here on the Sixers Talk podcast. Of course, we're brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilmington University and students are in the game, upskill in fields like cybersecurity, fintech, healthcare, and education in person or online. Get in the game at Wilmington University. Find us at wilmu.edu. Injured for over 70 years, Lundy Law has been the number one personal injury law firm in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Their services are exemplary. Their results are exceptional. Call 1-800-LUNDY-LAW to get the money you deserve. It's time to rush to new rewards at Rivers Casino. Now there's a whole new way for you to earn, redeem, and level up your rewards. Get your new Rush Rewards card and get more out of your game at Rivers Casino, Philadelphia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hey, um... Just one game in between podcasts here and uh, the Celtics national TV, uh, probably more eyeballs on that game uh, than than any other game um, in the association last night. But uh, it was funny afterward, uh, we're going to get post game sound. Uh, We're allowed in the locker room, as many people know. Uh, I'm there, Noah, and the media is gathered and uh, we're waiting because that is often the name of the game to speak with James Harden and not in the name of the game, as in he we're always waiting on him. But players get changed. You can imagine, you know, they take their time. Sometimes they play a long game. They're tired. So we go over to wait for James Harden and kind of he's finished getting dressed and he's talking to Michael Rubin and the media kind of forms toward his locker and there's a voice that goes, yeah, box him in. That's your only chance of getting them. That's the only chance y'all going to get that. 
And it's Montrez Harrell heckling us about James Harden for about like five, 10 minutes while we're trying to get sound from him. And him and Michael Rubin kind of step off to have their conversation more privately. And, and this is a new locker room. And then you hear, yeah, I think y'all might have lost them. You know, it's more than one exit in here. It's a new locker room. You know, there's more than one. So it was, you're getting heckled by Montrez Harrell as he's getting dressed. So it's like he's putting on all these gold chains and <laughs> platinum chains. He might have had like five of them on. Uh, it was funny, man. I wanted to laugh harder, but I had to keep my professionalism intact. But uh, funny, funny anecdotal moment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say definitely Montrez Harrell and Daniel House Jr. have added a ton of life and humor to the Sixers locker room. And, I, you know, as I think we've noted before, that that usually doesn't hurt, you know, as long as your team is, is not a bad basketball Lady. team. Yeah, just uh, keeping things fun and yeah. – Daniel House Jr. Um, he's a he's a wisecracking type, and he just he just like has his takes and he says them. There's no uh, beating around the bush. He's a big uh, Dr Pepper guy, so he always <laughs> needs that and uh, strongly prefers Dr Pepper over you know uh, any other you know cola option. Right. And you know, just had, you know shares that take and um, so yeah no M- Montres Harrell. Uh, yeah, hasn't been getting obviously minutes, but uh, he's still a lively presence in there. And uh, yeah, we were glad to see James Harden eventually return. And speak he did. Back. We did get to uh, speak with James. Did yeah. Not exit through some uh, secret corridor. And uh, yeah, he shared, shared his two cents on on the game. And he, by the way, had you know twenty points, ten assists, uh, zero turnovers, which usually we would uh, you know mention earlier. But you know, as we said, this was a uh, Joel Embiid is unbelievable kind of night. That is uh, the main headline uh, from, from this one. Uh, Noah, the website is always popping. Uh, I see you have your three observations up. Anything else you're working on here in between games as uh, it is the Atlanta Hawks on tap? Yes. Um, yeah. New column up on, on Duel Embiid and hitting on, on some of the themes we've, we've noted just with his all whole, you know, uncompassing uh, greatness and, uh, some of you know what it went into that last night. Uh, also, we'll have just a look at what truly matters here for the Sixers in the final three. So reviewing all the seeding, standing, potential matchups sort of stuff. Uh, the scoring title race, which obviously Joel Embiid you know, took a large step towards securing. Uh, and then some of the details, you know, that the Sixers want to improve. Um, and yeah, then I will uh, I'll be in ATL for uh, for that game. So uh, looking forward to that one. Not expecting you know, the Sixers to have everyone available, but uh, should still be interesting uh, regardless. Yeah, with you know, as we as we come down to the final three. Yeah, not quite the playoffs yet, folks, but we are getting there. Um, keep keep it locked here to the Sixers Talk podcast every step of the way. We will be taking you up until this thing comes to an end, wherever that happens. Uh, we appreciate you listening and watching wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, For Noah Levick and Ben Berry, I'm Danny Pummels. We'll see you next time.